Well, we're looking at the cross style of Jesus Christ as found in the book of Matthew. And we're dealing particularly with chapter uh, 16 of this powerful, powerful book. Do you know what a privilege it is to handle the Word of God and talk about uh, the cross style of Christ and see how Jesus is literally thinking and His heartbeat and what is taking place in the inner heart and mind of His very soul. Uh, what a privilege that is. And what we're seeing is the incarnation, Jesus leaping off of His throne, taking on flesh and literally displaying the entirety of the heart of God for us so that we can see the throbbing heart of God in our day on our streets. And I'm telling you that that's exactly what I want to be in my day on my streets. Oh, to be the heart of God expressed to my world. And that's one reason why I'm so excited about digging into and investigating and having revealed to me the very essence of the style of the Christ. I want his style. You understand, of course, that we're constantly talking about that we cannot duplicate his style. What we're interested in is not Im imitating the Jesus who was. We're interested in participating in the Christ who is right now, who wants to live within us and who wants to literally flow his style through us. So this is not learn the style, learn the techniques, get up a new set of rules and laws. This is not the idea of uh, develop a new pattern, develop a new style of life, and begin to imitate the kinds of things that Christ did. He wore his feet, so I wore his feet. It's not that kind of thing. It's the very essence of Christ getting close to his heart, knowing his very thought process, getting involved in the very soul of his being, literally being possessed with the very throbbing heart of God himself. And in that knowledge, in that awareness, in that experience of the throbbing heart of God from within, we begin to experience the wonder of Jesus living his style through us. And if Jesus is going to live his style through us, what kind of style will it be? It will be the style of the cross. Now you see that he is calling his disciples to this constantly throughout the book of Matthew. But especially it is zeroed in on the chapters that exist from chapter 16 on to the end. He's spending six months of his time literally uh, drilling his disciples, talking to them, trying to reveal to them the essence of what he's all about. He's trying to get them ready for the experience of the cross. And he's trying to get them involved in the thought process of the cross so they too will think like he thinks. See, he's not trying to get his disciples to do certain things. He's trying to get his disciples to feel like he feels and see like he sees and experience what he's experiencing, agonizing under what he's agonizing under. He's trying to get his disciples linked in oneness with himself until they can begin to experience his style. And he's calling them to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him as, of course, he was doing constantly with the Father. So he was always denying himself. Jesus never ever thought about himself. He was constantly giving himself away. It was never what was good for him. It was always redemptive process. So the whole style of the cross was not just again a set of rules. It was literally a flow of the life of God living through him. It was the expression of the heart of God. In the course of the theology of holiness, we've investigated this deeply. That what's happening is the nature of God is being expressed through the person of Jesus Christ. We are seeing the very heartbeat, the blood flow, what makes God's blood boil. We're experiencing that as we look into these scriptures. Now to experience it deep in our own heart as we experience Him. So the call is to embrace Him. The call is to get involved with Him. The call is to seek Him with your whole being. The call is, oh, that we might go to a whole new level, that we might experience the wonder of the indweltness of the person of Jesus Christ deep within us. That's the call of the hour. Will you seek him? Will you saturate in him? Will you go after him? Will you saturate in his word? And by the saturating in his word, be saturating in his person so that his word, living and written, can now begin to be expressed through you. That's the issue of this hour. We're looking at chapter 16. And uh, we are going to uh, continue in our study in chapter 16 as we uh, look down in verse 21 down through verse 23. And we want to read that portion of scripture together. So have your Bibles open so that we can investigate it together. Now just uh, to get us back into the flow of where we are, you remember we started at chapter 16 verse 13. And at chapter 16, verse 13, we began with the mystery of his 
person. So there are four mysteries given to us in this particular passage as it begins to unfold. And a mystery, you remember, is that which you cannot possibly know unless somebody who's on the inside track really reveals it to you. And of course, revelation is taking place. There was a mystery in an Old Testament. It was hid. It was not known. Paul says, this mystery has now been exposed to us. It's Christ in us. The secret is out. So all is now known and there is no secret. So here is the mystery of his person. But we're finding revelation given to us. So the secret is now out and we know who he really is. Now, as we moved into it, we found out that this revelation came from the person of God himself. Peter had been messing around in the mind of God. And right from the mind and the heart of God, a revelation had come. And what was the revelation? Oh, it was in answer to the question that Jesus asked in verse 15. But who do you say that I am? Peter jumped to his feet and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, You nailed it, son. You nailed it. Blessed are you. This is a fantastic thing. You got it down. This is who I am. The Christ, the Son of the living God. All that God is in his eternalness has now literally dipped its finger into our world and we have seen the pressure, the pressure of the very essence of the heart of God literally focusing on redemption for our world, forgiving sins bringing us back to what we ought to be and this is the Christ himself he is the finger of God in our generation, the eternal actions of God for the purpose of redemption, wow you are the Christ, the son of the living God, verse 16 what a statement, the mystery of his person and then he moves us to the mystery of his project. And he begins to talk to us about the church. See, the reason Jesus has come is for a purpose. He wants to build the living organism of the body of Christ himself. He wants that which the, the life of God can live through and be demonstrated through. Oh, to be an unmarred, unblemished demonstration of the likeness of Christ. That's what the body of Christ is to be. So we're not talking about organization. We're not talking about, oh, deacons. We're not talking about, oh, district superintendents. We're not talking about church structure. We're not talking about a 501c3 to get a tax break. We're not talking about big parking lots and great buildings. What we're talking about is the functioning body of Christ. I want to be a part of that body. I, I want to be a little detached stone placed by God himself upon the solid rock, the Petra of the very essence of the body of Christ. I, I, I want to be a, 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 an important key element playing at a role of significance in the whole flow of what the mind Christ himself wants to do through the body. So I want to be under the flow of his direction. I want to be a part of the functioning body of Christ that the purpose of redemption might be found, made, realized and known in, in my day. Um, th this is what the body of Christ is all about. Always redemptive. And the body of Christ is always spilling out with the style of the cross. Hey, never ever living, living for itself. You see, if Jesus took his own hands 2,000 years ago and nailed them to a tree, what do you think you, he's going to do with his hands in this day? Hey, if he took his own body and stretched it out naked before a world hanging on a tree for redemptive process, what do you think he's going to do with his body in this hour? It's going to be redemptive process. It's going to be spill your life out. It's going to be give yourself up. It's going to be never ever live for yourself kind of thing. So the style of the whole body of Christ is the style of the cross. No question about it. Now he brings us to verse 21. It may be the hardest section of the, of the mysteries, of the four mysteries. This may be the toughest one. The reason is because he's been building to this point. It's something of a climax. Now, the last uh, one is going to be the application of the mystery itself. But, but this one lays out the significance of what he's really all about. And we're calling it the mystery of his program. See, he declared the mystery of his person, which was fine and good, and we certainly want to understand that. And then the mystery of his pro project, which is what he's all about, where he's going, what he's trying to build, what he wants to bring about, so that he is building this project through which his style can flow. Now he's bringing us to the point, he says, I want, to know you, I want you to know what my program is. What is the actual style I want to have flow through you? 
And it's here that he distinctly, plainly lays out the idea of the style of the cross. And that's going to be the way redemption is going to take place. Let's look at chapter 16, verse 21. It says, From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Let me read that again. Listen to it closely. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Powerful scripture, isn't it? We want to spend some time analyzing it together, saturating in it, finding what God wants to say to us through this powerful, powerful scripture. Again, it's his program. It's what he's all about. It's the way he's going to pull this all off. Uh, it's the method by which what his dream is is going to be fulfilled. Uh, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you uh, how surprised you're going to be when Jesus finally shows up. Uh, I want to ask you that when he comes the second time and, and he appears and the whole thing is all wrapped up, I want, to, I want to know how startled you're going to be. How, wow, I, I didn't envision him like that. Well, oh, that, that isn't what I thought. Hey, I didn't, I didn't see him in my mind's eye like that. I, well, I didn't know that about him. Well, isn't that something? I had no idea he was like that either. I want to know how surprised you're going to be when he shows up the second time. But wouldn't it be something if we could get to know him so intimately? Wouldn't it be something if we could get so tight with him? Can you imagine this? Can you imagine becoming so, so in oneness with God, so flowing with his person, so wrapped up in his being, so intimate with the throb of his very heart, that when he shows up the second time, there would be no surprises? Oh, there might be some surprises in terms of looks. There, there might be some, su some surprises in terms of, oh, his hair is long, his hair is short, his dress. There might be some surprises in, oh, I didn't know it was going to happen like that. Can you imagine the sky splitting wide open like this? Oh, that's startling. Yes, there might be some surprises in that way. But when it comes down to him and knowing him, when it comes down to him and focusing on him, hey, no surprises. Why? Because you know him so well. You have gotten so well acquainted with him. Hey, he has become so one with you. you. You know the throbbing heart. You know how he thinks. You know how he feels. You know what he's all about. That there'll be instant rapport with him when he shows up in the flesh. No surprises with God. Because you know him. Oh, I want to get to know him. Well, really well, intimate. I, w I want to know his program. I want to know how he thinks. This is my goal. This is the essence of my heartbeat. This is what I want more than anything else, to grasp him, to embrace him, to know him like this. See, in the New Testament, the, 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 the New Testament people had a difficult time accepting, understanding wh who he was. He, he, was, he was a surprise to them. Can you imagine they had studied the Messiah throughout the Old Testament? The scribes, the chief priests, the elders, man, they knew this stuff. See, it was nothing for them when Herod the king came and said, well, where's the Messiah going to be born? They knew immediately. Why? Because they were experts on this Messiah. Hey, they knew he was going to be born in Bethlehem, according to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. See, there was no surprises for them in, the, in, in that area. Hey, they, they knew the deep things, hey, didn't they? Hey, they had studied the scriptures. They knew the ins and outs of what the Messiah was to be like. And yet when he showed up, they were totally, absolutely surprised. In fact, they did not even recognize him and would not accept him because he didn't fit what they thought he was supposed to be. He, he didn't have the style they thought he was supposed to have. 
See, they, they, he didn't fit the mold. He, he didn't play the messiahship rules. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. He didn't run with the kind of people he was supposed to run with. See, there was something off between what they had studied, what they had found out, what they knew, and who Jesus was. They were so far off track that Jesus was a total, absolute surprise to them. It's true even for the disciples, you understand. For three years, the disciples walked with him intimately. They had on-the-job training with him, and he had laid it out for them. He taught them. He, he gave them what they needed for three solid years. But even then, they were constantly being surprised by him, astonished at him, because, see, they, what they had in their mind, what they conceived, what they saw him to be, and how they saw him to act was so different than what he actually did and how he actually was. The cross was certainly a surprise to them. Hey, they had no idea this was where he was going. He spent six months training them in the essence of the cross, teaching them and telling them about it. And they were so far removed and so far off, they, didn't, they had so little knowledge, they didn't seem to grasp it at all to the point that, hey, when the cross actually took place, they were startled. They, they couldn't believe it. They thought he was wiped out. They thought it was defeat when over and over again he told them that he was going to come forth from the grave and this was going to be his victory. But see, they didn't get it. They, they weren't close enough to him. Oh, yeah, they lived with him. Oh, yeah, they watched him. Yeah, but they were focused. See, their mind focus was on something else. They hadn't grasped the essence of what he was all about. They were so unready for his death that, they, that when it happened, they scattered like rats. They, they missed it. What do you want to do with that? How do you want to drag that into the middle of your life? See, it would really be awful that if he'd show up the second time, man, you would be so unready for that thing, man. Oh, yeah, you've been to an altar. You bumped your head once there, twice there. Yeah, you've had all the experiences. And, and hey, you fit into the theological mode. But, man, it's so radical to you because who he is and the way he thinks and how he functions and, and what the kingdom is all about and the essence of the style of the kingdom you've missed. And see, I'm convinced that if you don't get in on the style now, you're not going to be able to do the style then, which means you're not going to be there. So you see, the essence of the whole thing is somehow becoming one, somehow getting so intimate, somehow becoming such a part of him, somehow cluing in, somehow becoming so tight with this divine God that his life, your life, whoa, has become one. And you and him literally begin to flow in the same style. And, and, and it won't be any surprise to you. He's teaching his disciples. It's the last six months of his ministry. He's starting out. This seems to be something of the beginning of that six months. He's pulling them into Gentile territory. He's focusing on them. He's going to give a complete, absolute concentration and focus on these disciples. He's got to get them ready for what's going down. Hey, he's got to get them ready for the cross. They've got to grasp this. They've got to begin to eat. They've got to start thinking like he thinks. They've got to get a hold of this fundamental of the style of the cross. So he's teaching them. He begins, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his, to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. This must have been mind-boggling to them. Hey, the idea that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, mystery of his person. Hey, that certainly stretched them. Peter got that information from God. But yeah, they, they could buy into that. Yes, he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hey, we believe that. But after all, hadn't they believed that all along? I mean, didn't they leave their families and travel all over the countryside because they believed that? Didn't they live out of Days Inn, eat at McDonald's? Hey, hadn't they left a million dollar fishing business in order to follow him for the purpose of the fact that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God? So you see, that wasn't too far fetched for them. That didn't stretch them very far because they really did believe that, you understand. That was the essence of, what, of the reason they'd given their lives to him. 
Hey, there was no one else to go to. When everybody else had left, Jesus turned to them and said, Are you going to leave too? And they said, We have nowhere else to go. No one else has the words of life. We believe you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. We believe that, Jesus. We, we're locked in on that. Hey, come on. We're dedicated to that. Jesus said, Fine. And when they talked to them about their, his project, that must have stretched them somewhat. But then after all, they knew he came for some reason and they had in their mind the concept of the kingdom. Yes, yeah, the kingdom. And they, they, could, they could translate that into terms of the church. Yes, that he's come to build the kingdom and they were going to be a part of it. And they, he was going to be the solid rock foundation. That the word of God was going to be the essence of the foundation of the whole thing. And yes, there would, they would be the detached stones, the little detached stones that would be form the structure of what he was building. And they were thrilled to do that and they already had that concept somewhat in their mind so that wasn't mind stretching for them but oh this program thing it blew them out of the water this program thing they, they could handle that see this idea of the son of man must suffer many things must bleed suffer and die the whole idea of a bleeding suffering dying messiah was so radical it it just it just struck them deep in their heart upset them in their emotional structure destroyed the very the very function of everything that they had believed and been operating in the patterns and the routines and and the traditions that they had established man this just this blew them out of the water Hey, that he was a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah. You see, it's one thing to believe he's a Christ, the Son of the living God. It's another thing to understand what the content of that is. You see, a gigantic shift has been made here. See, we're no longer discussing the idea, is he divine, isn't he divine? That issue settled. We're not discussing the idea, is he the Messiah, isn't he the Messiah? That issue settled. See, the disciples have that settled in their mind. They, they believe with all their heart he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. They've given themselves to him for that purpose so they understand that. that e they're not going to discuss that anymore. Jesus doesn't need to raise that issue. Do you really believe I am the Messiah? Hey, they've settled that one. They are absolutely, definitely convinced. Again, that's why they followed him around the countryside for three solid years. Because they believe that with all their heart. They left their fishing business. They left with their families that, that for this reason. So, hey, that issue is settled. Now the whole issue that Jesus is going to discuss with them for the next six months is not, am I the Messiah? Am I not the Messiah? I want you to be sure and believe that. No, they believe that. That's settled. The issue now is, what kind of Messiah am I? What's the content of my Messiahship? See, that really, really matters here. For this is the style, this is the content of my Messiahship. See, you stand to your feet and say, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, that's fine and good, man. But do you know what that means? Do you know what the essence of that is? Do you know what the flow of that is all about? Do you know what the content of that is all like? Do you know what it's like to be the Christ, the Son of the living God? He says, I want to tell you, it's bleeding, suffering, and dying. I'm going to spill my life out. That's why I've come. The very essence, the throbbing heart, Heart, the very motivation, the internal nature of what it is to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, is to bleed, suffer, and die. See, this is my program. Hey, guys, the way we're going to win a world is not hot shot programs. Come on. The way we're going to win a world is not getting the quartet up and wowing the crowds. Come on. It's not slick sermons. Come on, guys. The way we're going to win our world is how? We're going to intersect our world at the point of their need. And the minute we intersect our world at the point of their need, blood is going to be spilt and bleeding, suffering, and dying creates a redemptive process. Hey, we're going to go out and embrace those who desperately need us. Those who can't give back we're going to get involved with those. We're going to get involved with those that can't benefit us. We're going to live without a hook on the end. We're going to live with no hidden agenda. We're going to live with no subtle motive. We're going to live not to build our own career. We're going to live so as not to build our own image. We're going to live not so, oh, I can really have a good ministry. We're not, we're not going to live so that we can be applauded. Don't you understand? We're going to live to spill our lives out, bleed, suffer, and die. Never ever think about ourselves. See, that's 
why we're going to live. And ministry, redemptive process, is naturally going to flow out of that. We're going to spill our lives out and get involved in the hurts and the pain of our world. And as we get involved in the hurts and pain of our world, hey, blood will be spilt. My blood, man, and blood mingled with his. My puny, anemic little blood mingled with the dynamic, powerful blood of Christ will create redemptive process anew and afresh in my day. And they will know the reality of the bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah in their midst. He wants to do that through us. This is the content of his Messiahship. Now, of course, you know that they rebuked him. And why did they rebuke him? Because it's so obvious that if he is going to be a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah, oh, brother, do you know what's going to happen here? Hey, they are going to be called upon to bleed, suffer, and die as well. So the whole essence of what's going on here is a struggle within the disciples, their own mind and their heart, of embracing the content of his Messiahship. See, they want to embrace a Messiah who's going to save them. They want to embrace a Messiah who will take them off to glory. They want to embrace a Messiah who will give them position in the kingdom. They want to embrace a Messiah who will give them right hand, left hand. But hey, what about embracing a Messiah who's bleeding, suffering, and dying? What about embracing a Messiah who's going to spill his life through us in the style of the cross. See, that's the issue. See, I want a Jesus who's going to save me. I want a Jesus who's going to build a place for me. I want a Jesus who's going to give me a mansion in the sky with big uh, golden chandelier in the middle, lazy boy recliner, and big screen TV. But hey, very, uh, embracing a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah who's going to spill his life out through me, who's going to require my blood, who will never ever let me think about myself, but always think about others, that will only let me have ministry that is his ministry through me, so so that I can never get any credit for me. Who calls me to death. The death of myself and all that I am. That he might live totally through me. Who calls me to give up the right to live my own life. Can you imagine embracing that kind of Messiah. And knowing a redemptive process in our world. See that was startling. Mind boggling to the disciples. Uh, let's look carefully at the passage. Uh, look at verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. We're entitling this verse, His Impact, The Plan. This is the plan. Now we're going to go to verse 22, and in verse 22 we're going to see uh, the, our ignorance, the plot which is verse 22. And Peter, of course, is displayed there. And then we're going to go into verse 23 and we're going to see Satan's influence, the persecutor. So we're breaking these three, three verses up into three key concepts. Number one, his impact, the plan. Number two, our ignorance, oh, the plot. Uh, number three, uh, Satan's uh, influence, the persecutor. Now, let's begin by looking at verse 21 again. We're calling this the impact, his impact, the plan. You see, he has a plan, and it is a bleeding, suffering, dying plan. I want you to note particularly this. Number one, I want you to note its necessary quality. Did you see how strong he is on this? Uh, look again at the words in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must, he must, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. He must. Did you see the emphasis? He must. I know you got this in your saturation. He must. This is an absolute necessity. It's necessary quality. See, what he's saying to us is, this is not up for grabs. I, I'm not discussing this with you. This is not, oh, here's an idea. Do you want to vote on it? See, I, I'm not bringing this up for the purpose of debate. Hey, this is not about what's your opinion. Oh, your opinion. Is there a way we could curb it? Let's discuss this together and see if we can come up with a blossomed out kind of plan. No, we're not doing that. I'm telling you, this is an absolute must. This is the way it has to be. This is the burning path 
satisfaction of the heart. This is already set in concrete. Hey, this was determined from the beginning of time. Don't you understand that God the Father literally instituted this one for, from the very outset of this thing? See, I knew I was getting involved in this from the moment I leaped off my throne. You understand the taking on a flesh was for this purpose. Hey, this is an absolute must. See, not to follow through now with the bleeding, suffering, dying would be to abort everything that I've come and everything that's been put into this, the whole unfolding of an Old Testament. Don't you understand? Every sacrificial lamb that has been offered all points to this. So this is an absolute must. Don't you see that all the prophecies of the old literally hang on this? Don't you see that everything that God did in an Old Testament, every time he moved his little finger, man, it was for this purpose. Every time he flexed his muscles, it was for this divine reason. Don't, don't you understand that? So that what's going on here is an absolute must. See, this absolutely has to be. See, there is absolutely no way out of this. This has been behind it, the divine initiative. This is the divine motive and flows from the very nature and the heart of God himself. See, this is a must. Wow. That's phenomenal, isn't it? Now, you see this in the passage itself and especially in the word must. He must go to Jerusalem. You understand he must is one particular Greek word. And if you analyze that word, you will discover it has five usages in the New Testament. And I'd like to look at those usages with you. Five distinct usages for the word must in the New Testament. Uh, number one, it has the idea, the word must in the New Testament. I must do this. I ought to do this. This has to be. That, this Greek word is used in connection with the idea that the must, the ought to, lies in the nature of the case. Uh, let me give that to you again. There are five usages for this word. Must, ought to, have to, motivated, it, this, this, this is the design, this particular word. And, and one of those, one of the five, is that this must, this compulsion, this obsession, lies in the nature of the case itself. Now this is true in the scene, an example of this, is it's true in the scene of the, the uh, prodigal son. You know the story well. But I'd like for you to turn to the passage itself. I'd like for you to see it. It's Luke chapter 15. And if you turn to Luke chapter 15, you see that Jesus is telling uh, three parables, actually, as you remember. And uh, they are tremendous parables, and they all say the same thing. But when it comes down to talking about the prodigal son story, this, this idea shows up, this must concept. And he uses that same identical Greek word right here. In fact, it's in verse 32. The father is speaking to the elder son. After throwing the party, you understand, and says in verse 32, it was right. Now that's the same identical word. It was right. It was a must. Hey, I didn't have any choice in this. Hey, this was not a matter of debate. This was not up for grabs. See, this absolutely had to be. It was right because it lies in the nature of the case itself. It just, it was a flow of, of, of the way things are. It just had to be. It was a must. Now, you know the story. Prodigal son has taken his check, his, his inheritance. Hey, gone to the riotous land and squandered the whole thing. Elder brother has stayed faithful. Hey, he's been out there milking the cows at 5 a.m. every morning. Hey, he's been out there in the field, man. Hey, he's been eating the dust of the field. Hey, the father wouldn't have a farm if it wasn't for this elder brother. Hey, people drive by, look at the elder brother on the tractor and say, Whoa, wish I had a son like that. I mean, this is the epitome of the kind of son you want. He is is so faithful. Hey, he does all the things he's supposed to do, keeps all the rules. Hey, honor his father. He doesn't party. He isn't on drugs. He works like a dog. He carries out the trash. Wow, what a boy. That other son of his, hey, he's gone, man. He's split. Hey, he wasn't going to work. He doesn't contribute to the farm. Hey, he's not involved in this at all. Hey, what a, what a scoundrel. I mean, squandered the whole inheritance. Hey, he's out there right now living with the pigs. You understand, from the Jewish viewpoint, living with the pigs, 
I mean living, li actually living with the pigs. I mean eating what they eat and living with the pigs is a picture of as low as you can get. I mean you can't go, they weren't allowed to eat pigs, you know. This is as low as you can go. They don't even raise pigs. This is as low as you can go. Prodigal son comes to himself, says, hey, I'm about to starve to death. My father has Big Macs that thick, man. Hey, my dad has T-bone steaks that thick. I don't know why I'm starving to death here. I'm going home. I'm going to say I'm sorry. Flips his coat over the backs of those pigs, jumps the fence and heads for home, man. And repents. He's covered with pig scum, you understand. He smells like a pig. He looks like a pig. He's been eating what the pigs eat. Probably is a pig. Here he comes. Father spots him. You know the story. Comes running down the road, meets his boy, grabs him, kisses him on his pig scum nose, man. Hey, embraces him, says, son, oh, come, and brings him into the house, puts a new robe on his back, puts a finger of sonship on his, on his puts a ring of, of, of sonship on his finger. He, 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 just, he just thrilled with the fact that his boy is back. He kills a fatted calf. He, 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 he calls for a big Party, he brings in the band, the whole thing, man. It is, it's a must. See, it has to be. It just, what else could the father do? It lies in the nature of the case. Do you see it? It lies in the nature of the case. It's just, it's the way the father is. He kills a fatted cat. Now, the conversation comes about, of course, as the elder brother comes in. Elder brother comes in, hears this music. Hey, what's going on? Hey. The fatted calf has been killed, the servant says. Your, your prodigal brother has returned. He is furious. Killed the fatted calf. That's my calf. I raised him from birth. Hey, I had him on a bottle. His mother died. Hey, that calf would have died. Now you've killed that calf for my brother. Hey, and what, how he must have griped. He isn't going to go into that party. Finally, the father comes out, pleads with him, come into the party, son. And he says, you never threw a party for me. Why would you throw a party for this prodigal son of yours? And then comes verse 32. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and alive again and was lost and is found. Don't you understand? The nature of the case demands merriment. The nature of, nature of the case demands joy. The nature, it's a must. It absolutely had to be. It's just the way it is. See, there's something of that same element in this passage. Hey, bleeding, suffering, and dying, it has to be. It just, it just has to be, don't you understand? It's just the nature of the case. All oh, the terribleness of sin, the great need of redemption, all oh, the love of the Father for those who need to be redeemed, all oh, the brokenness that's coming over sin, all oh, the destructive nature of what's going down, all oh, the hurt that people are involved in, the death that they are experiencing, the nature of the case demands this. Bleeding, suffering, and dying, has to be. You cannot sit back. You cannot idly uh, 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 live in, in, in existence. You, you cannot just meander through the idea of religion. You can't just sit around and discuss baptism. You can't just sit in this classroom, man. Don't you understand the nature of the case? The, it, it lies, the must lies in the nature of the case. It, it drives you. It just has to be. You've got to, you've got to move out, man. You, you have to bleed suffer and die. You've got to spill your life out. You don't have any choice. It, look, look at what's going on. Look at the face of the elderly. Look at the face of the widow. Look into the face of the widower. Look, at, look into the face of the poverty stricken. Look into the hurts. Look into the, in the broken homes. Look into the pain. Look into the children who don't have a single chance, man, unless something drastically happens in their lives. Look at them. It's a must. It's a must. Bleeding, suffering, and dying is a must. We cannot idly sit back. We cannot live in comfort. Come on, look, look at it. Look at it. It lies in the nature of the case. Now there is a second usage of the word must uh, as found in the New Testament. Not only does it lie in the nature of the case, 
but it also is brought about by the circumstances. Now these two are really paralleled and are very close, but there's a difference. See the first one, it lies in the nature of the case. The second one is, it's brought about by the circumstances. And for that I want you to turn as an example to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And you need to turn there, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. And here Paul is boasting. It's the whole scene of him boasting. And uh, it's almost as if he apologizes for this boasting. Uh, and of course you know the circumstances of what was going on. But it's down in verse 30. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 30. L look at what he said. If I boast, if I must boast, there's that word again. See, it's the same identical word that's used, that Jesus is using. If I must boast, hey, if I'm forced to do this, if, if, if by the very motivation of this moment, if, if by the circumstances that surround me, I am forced to do this, if, if of necessity, I just, I just have to because of the way things have come together. If I must boast, I'll tell you this, I'm going to boast I'm going to boast in the things which concern my infirmities. Hey, I'm not, I'm not going to boast about, whoa, how talented I am. I'm not going to boast about, whoa, how educated I am. I'm not going to boast about, whoa, how effective my ministry is going. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to boast about how, uh, about the merit badges I've won. See, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast about, oh, how weak I've been. I'm going to boast about all the things that I've suffered. I'm going to boast about all the pain I've gone through. I'm going to boast about the thing, those, my infirmities, my infirmities. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Wouldn't it be something if we didn't brag on people about their talent? We didn't brag on people about, hey, how talented they are. We didn't brag because, oh my, you're so good looking, you're so sharp, you're so educated, you're so smart. We didn't brag on people about those kind of things. The only boasting we had going on was the boast of what we've suffered and gone through for the sake of Christ. Hey, want to take off your shirt and show the marks? Paul said, I bear in my body the marks, man, the marks of the Lord Jesus. I look at my flesh, I don't have a mark, man. Where's the marks? Hey, the marks of sin are all over me, but where's the marks of the Christ? Hey, what, what can I boast in? If I must boast. And apparently he felt like he did have to boast. You understand that the Judaizers had been going around from church to church and they had been undermining uh, his apostleship, his ministry. And he, they were undermining his authority so that people were saying, well, we shouldn't listen to him because he's not really an apostle. So he is defending his apostleship uh, in, this, in this whole scene, saying, listen, you ought to take note of me. You ought to pay attention to what I've got to say. Hey, I am the voice of God to you in this hour. You, you need to listen to what's coming out of my mouth. And you need to listen to what's coming from my pen. You need to read and take heed to what I'm saying to you. The reason is because I am defending my apostleship to you and the reason is because I am driven to it by the circumstances of the hour. Now I want you to take that and bring it back into this verse and see that, hey, something of that is even here. I must go to Jerusalem. Oh, I must. I, I don't have any chance. To, to, I don't have any choice. The, the circumstances that I'm in demand it. Hey, the circumstance of being born of a virgin, the circumstance of coming and taking on flesh, the circumstance of giving up all that I am as God, the circumstance, man, the circumstances all around us, the pressure of the Pharisees, the circumstance of sin, the great need of my day, man, the overwhelming pressure of my eyes hour squeezes me. This, this is an absolute must. Bleeding, suffering, and dying just has to be, guys. It has to be. Look at the circumstances around you. Hey, the, the absolute necessity of, of this must is here. Why, why? Well, look at the circumstances, man. There is absolutely no chance of moving your world without bleeding, suffering, and dying. The circumstances will never be changed. Hey, lives of people will never be altered. Don't you understand? We're not going to, hey, we're going to have simply a, a, a kind of a quick fix, a temporary fix at best, man. We'll put band-aids on cancer at best unless somehow, someway, bleeding, suffering, and dying takes place in our day. 
No, there's a third way this word is used in the scriptures. It's found in the story of the Good Samaritan, and that is John chapter 4, uh, verse 20, is what I'd like for you to turn to now. John chapter 4, verse 20. And it's in this story that you see a third usage for the must. It's, uh, it's a must that is a requirement to obtain a certain end. In other words, to accomplish what we want to accomplish, this is a must. If this is your goal, then this is required. And in chapter 4, verse 20, he, uh, he brings that uh, uh, he brings that to pass. It's the woman. It's not the good Samaritan. It's the a woman of Samaria who's at the well. The woman of uh, uh, at the well that Jesus ministered to. You remember the story. He's come, of course, to the well. Uh, they're going through Gentile territory, Samaritan territory. Come to the well. When they come to the well, he sends his disciples off. And uh, he enters into a discussion with this woman who comes at an off time. Why? Because she, uh, she's living with a fifth man who's not really her husband. So all the circumstances of that uh, bring her to come to the well when she doesn't have to intermix with everybody else who scorns her. And when they get together, of course, uh, Jesus uh, tells her about the water and asks her to draw water for him. And, and as they fall into a conversation, she begins to talk about worship. Oh, you remember it. Look at verse 20. Chapter 4, verse 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Ought to worship. Ought. That's the same identical word. What she's saying, oh, I, I've heard you Jews talk, yeah. And you say, you must, you have to, it's the thing to do, you got to. It's, it's, uh, it's the place to worship. In other words, if you want to worship God properly, then you ought to, you must, it's required, that's the place to go. And of course, Jesus answers that and says, the hour is coming when we're going to not worship in Jerusalem uh, alone. We're going to worship uh, in spirit and in truth. Uh, we're going to worship the Father in verse 23 in spirit and in truth for their Father is seeking such to worship Him. Now take that and bring that right into this and you discover the same kind of concept. See, if we're going to accomplish this end, the end of what? Redemption of a world. Then this is an absolute must. Hey, if we want to accomplish these, this end, if we want this goal, if this is what we're after, then hey, this is an absolute must. We don't have any choice. Now let me give you a uh, fourth one that uh, way this is used in the New Testament. It's used not only because it lies in the nature of the case. And it, it's not only because it's required by the circumstances. And it's not only because if you want to achieve a certain end, this is required. But also it's required to obtain, uh, it's a must in relationship to law and or command. In other words, it's a duty. We've been commanded, so we must do this because it's a law. Now you see this in Luke chapter 11, verse 42. And I want you to turn there. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. And in verse 42, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And again, you know this scene well. It's the scene where the woe to the Pharisees is pronounced. And Jesus turns to... Uh, the Pharisees, uh, one who has actually come to him and been all upset because he didn't wash his hands before he ate. And of course, they're really into that ceremonial law stuff. And Jesus begins to talk to him about the outside of the cup and the dish are clean, but the inward part is full of greed and wickedness. And then down in verse 42, listen to this verse. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought, there's that word again, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. See, uh, yeah, you, sh you should. I mean, it was required of you. Yeah, the law. Yeah, to tithe the mint, the rue. Yeah, to go, to, to go down and herbs. Yeah, tithe your herbs. That tithing, it's okay. It's a must. Yeah, it's the law. Okay, do it. But hey, man, if you did that because you had to, if you did that because it was a must, if there was a must upon your life, if there was a requirement upon your life to do that, how much more these other things should be done? Things like love of God, things like justice. Hey, these have a greater compulsion, a greater demand, a greater law calls you to, calls, calls you to this. 
Now take that and bring it back here. Jesus says he must bleed, suffer, and die. Why? Yeah, it's a command, but it's, it's a command from the heart of God, do you understand? Hey, it, it's, it's a duty. Yeah, but it's a duty of the love of God himself. See, I, I look at my world and what, hey, my whole insides command me that this must be accomplished. I must bleed, suffer, and die and spill my life out. I must give myself away. I, I must do this. What else can I do? Hey, it's a command. It's, it's a driving cry of my insides. It's the duty of my very being. It's, it's to, not, to not bleed, suffer, and die would be to disobey. To not bleed, suffer, and die and spill my life out would be to cut off the law itself. To not have the fulfillment of all the law of God. For you realize the fulfillment of all the law of God is love. See, this cross is of absolute necessity. Absolute necessity. Hey, Will you feel, will you burn with that absolute necessity of bleeding, suffering, and dying in your life?